This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 425, recorded on January 20th, 2017. This episode of TWIV is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twiv. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Fresh out of a class. You bet. A class action suit. Uh, no, not quite. I was wearing a leisure clothes at the time. Leisure Larry? Is that something? <laughs> is that a real thing? No, class action suit was not a suit. <clears throat> class action. Oh, I had a good class this, this afternoon. I found out who my students were in uh, ecology for designers at Fordham University on the downtown campus, and I had a great time. I had um, a lively discussion with uh, six undergraduates and two graduate students sitting in. I'm glad you didn't have a morbid discussion. No, that would have been in medical school. <laughs> Dixon, here in New York City, it's mostly cloudy. It is. I mean, I'm looking across the river here, and I can't even see half of New Jersey, which I can usually see, but it's... Not that you know, you'd want to. Not that you'd want It's to. seven degrees Celsius. Yeah. And um, it's kind of... It's pretty yucky. blah. It's been this way all week, hasn't it's it? It's meh. You think it's better elsewhere in the country? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's do that. <laughs> Joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you hey, doing? Rich. Well. It is better here, yes. Uh, it is uh, 73 degrees. And you know, they're calling it sunny. It's kind of high, wispy <laughs> clouds. Uh, that's uh, 23 Celsius, by the way. So it's good. We uh, we had a lot of rain and a lot of gray days and stuff, but we're in for um, a week or so of good stuff. Sounds good. Good. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, it's Kathy. really foggy here, <clears throat> and ah. the temperature is 37 Fahrenheit, 3 yeah. degrees Celsius. Right. Foggy bottom. Right. Yeah. Well, has it been foggy all week or just today? No, just foggy today, and it just... It was supposed to be foggy this morning. It didn't seem very foggy then, but now it is. Mm. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's um, it's overcast, uh, low overcast at about 2,500 feet. Um, and uh, temperatures four, dew points minus one. So, by the way, Rich, you're, uh, you, you do have sort of a broken layer at about 25,000 feet. So, yeah. That's, that's very high. <laughs> a broken layer where are, at Where are you getting that information? I'm getting that from the Aviation Weather Center, on, uh, National <laughs> Weather Service. Planning to right. fly to Austin today? No, no, no. not uh, not anytime soon. Uh-huh. A and broken he's not layer. Planning on, he's also not planning planning on flying at twenty five thousand feet. No, no, I guess no. Would. That is not I, uh-huh. no, not the planes I fly. I just love right. that a broken layer at twenty five thousand feet. We'll have to keep that in mind as a title. That would be a good episode. A broken. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know for what, but we'll figure it out. I like that very much. You'd probably talk about chickens or something like that, you know. All right. We <laughs> are still working. This is the third week, listeners. We're still working on the Infections of Leisure book contest. All right. Now, uh, if I recall, let me scroll down here and see what I said. Uh, you are uh, the, the um, 17th emailer. <clears throat> supposed to uh, get this book now. That was December 17th. <laughs> we announced it. And we're still not to 17 listeners. So either no one's listening, and you just download it, because I do know that 20,000 people are downloading episodes, or you don't want Infections of Leisure, at right. least a book about it. But we'll eventually get there. We're close, <clears throat> not quite yet. Over on TWIM, we had a contest. I think it was the 13th. Listener, we got that uh, after two weeks. Nice. Probably uh, depends on what you're giving away. It does, doesn't it? You know, over on TWIM, we gave away a two-volume, 14-pound book set on the Manual of Clinical Microbiology. Oh, wow. People wanted it. 
14 Guess pounds, so. I know, because I mailed it off this morning. <laughs> the, man, the Manual of Clinical Microbiology. Everything That's you wanted to know. Stuff. Everything you wanted to know. Volume 2. Probably got some really gross pictures in it and stuff, right? Uh, no, not really. It's all lab stuff, lab tests lab. to detect microbes. It's like Berge's Manual okay. almost. And um, back in the old days. fortunately, there's something in the U.S. Postal Service called Media Mail. Right. Well, great. Yes. Really cheap. Uh, it'll be there next year. It is. It is slow, <laughs> but it is fine. Cheap. It is slow. Th- this information is not going anywhere. I think elephants carry those packages. Yes. yes. Speaking of going somewhere, we're all going to go to ASV, right, Kathy? Yes. yes. It's going to be in Madison, June 24th to 28th. And we just got our letter today from Thea Sawicki, the Secretary Treasurer, spelling out the details of it. So if you're a member, and why wouldn't you be? Uh, you got all the information about the meeting with links to the website and discussion of the satellites. And it's uh, it says in there that there's a $75 fee for the satellites. But, of course, there's the career satellite that's free to the 100 students and trainees that register for it. So that's a satellite in a different category. And there was... Oh, yeah. One other thing I want to say as program chair, because I know you're now all thinking about your abstracts, which are due very soon, February 1st, which is a Wednesday at midnight, um, (laughs) that you need to think about who is going to be the first author of your abstract. That person has to be the presenting author, and that has to be listed that way on the submission form. It creates some small nightmares for the program committee when that's not the case. Rich can probably vouch for that to some extent. Yes, so, <laughs> there are so, there are there are there is a storm of nightmares for the uh, program chair, as you well know, Kathy, yes. lurking out there in the corners. Right. So we want to try and uh, prevent that one as much as we can. So if you're gonna be at the meeting and be presenting, then list yourself as the first author. And if you think that you're going to have to withdraw the abstract because you won't be there, then don't request a workshop because that really messes things up. Uh, We can have a co-author present it, but if you don't have a co-author that's going to attend, then then don't request an oral abstract. So just a couple things there. So if you're not an ASV member, and why wouldn't you be, um, you can become a member, which is important if you're a trainee and you want to apply for travel grants. And you need to do that by February 1st as well, the applications for travel grants. Go to asv.org, click on annual meeting, then click on annual meeting again, and you'll be at the website and it will have all the information about abstracts. Back on the first ASV.org site is the membership information, but they're all kind of cross-linked. So I think that's all the information you need for now. Get working on your abstract. All right. Cool. I want to also tell you about a joint ASM-ASV conference on the interplay of viral and bacterial pathogens. It's organized by Christian Wobus, Stephanie Karst, Julie Pfeiffer, Stacy Schultz-Cherry, and Vincent Young, who I am proud to say have all been on TWIV or TWIM. This is happening May 1st through 4th in Bethesda, Maryland. One of the hottest new topics in biomed research, trans-kingdom interactions between viruses and bacteria in the gut and how they influence health and disease. This meeting is co-sponsored by our beloved American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology. It's a brand new conference that will bring together scientists from different disciplines to discuss razor-sharp cutting-edge research findings related to this hot topic. Some of the sessions will be understanding the cellular and organismal intestinal host response. Do you like that, Dixon? Uh, Very classic. The interplay between enteric viruses, pathogenic bacteria, and microbiota, novel approaches to model intestinal infections, and much more. Abstract deadline, February 21st. There will be a link in the show notes you know about show notes, right? A, it's it's all at microbe.tv slash twiv and then twiv-425 for this episode. That's how you can reach any twiv episode. microbe.tv slash twiv slash twiv dash episode number. It's funny. Frequently when I'm just having a casual conversation with somebody, I end up wishing that there were show notes that I could refer back to for that conversation. <laughs> what was that they told me about? <laughs> casual conversation. Right. 
All right, we have one follow-up, which I, I'm afraid is, is going to pose quite a challenge to all of us. But you know, I, I thought I would read it anyway. It's from Paul, who writes, To the Twivel Seat. You get that, Dixon? I got it. What is it playing off? Swivel seat. And what does that mean? Turning around So and it around means the occupant around. gets fired and rehired and fired. <laughs> is that right? It's about recycling. <laughs> Sunny 7C with rising pressures and 16 kilometers of visibility out my window in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I appreciated your discussion of prion assays in TWIV 424. It reminded me of several Lewis Thomas essays where he advocated focusing on the unexplained and inconsistent phenomenon as signposts to break through knowledge. He repeatedly focused on the example of the transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, anomalous and at the time unexplained phenomena. My question for you and your many guests is, what are the anomalous and unexplained phenomena in virology today? The mm. facts and circumstances that defy explanation by the standard model. I mean, it might be in the eighth genomic arrangement for viruses. <laughs> not, that's not I an can't. anomalous phenomenon. <laughs> uh, gee. Anomalous, though, oh. that's the key. It's not just unexplained, but anomalous. Something that doesn't well, make sense. if it's an anomalous phenomenon, I can't name it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Here we go. Mm. He's here on Wednesday to try the veal. Yeah. Just, just unexplained, you would say? Mm. Well, you know, Tons you of know. that. What, Tons give, of that. Give us one, Dixon. Of unexplained phenomena? How yeah, about, in virology. In how virology. about the lack of identifying receptors for viruses? It's just something we haven't found. It's well, it's unexplained. Right, but we haven't explained it. It's unexplained. I want something really fascinating. You know, like a protein-based infectious agent. That's that's that totally those cool. are pretty fascinating, yeah. Yeah. True. And and what I, I mean, where do those come from initially and why does that persist evolutionarily? And that's that is pretty cool. I want to know where viruses came from. You know, that, I was kind of, uh, that's where I was drifting to, is because, uh, you know, that's at the heart of evolution of life yes. in general, I think. That's that's where my mind was going with this. The, ho the whole evolutionary uh, arrangement there, that uh -huh. who was first, viruses first, did cells come from viruses. By the way, in our latest twin, which will be out next week, we talked about a paper where they show that a phage infects a bacterium and makes a nucleus-like structure. I read that. Oh, my oh, gosh. I did, too. Oh, my gosh. I read, I read it in your blog it, post. It, it sequesters yeah. the DNA of the organism so, so the they can have their way DNA with the rest. So the phage DNA comes out of the <coughs> phage yeah, yeah, into yeah, the yeah. bacterial cytosol. It then is transcribed to mRNA. Some proteins are made, and then one of the proteins forms a shell around the DNA, and the DNA replicates in the shell, so everything needed for DNA replication and transcription gets imported into the shell and then the the proteins get made in the cytoplasm so somehow the mrnas get out and then the the capsids are made in the cytoplasm and then they dock onto this structure pick up dna and move off <laughs> oh my gosh viruses yeah. invented everything <laughs> so alio that seems like it's kind of that seems like it's kind of doing it the hard way <laughs> well you well, know they, i don't i don't know what it was a response to though yeah, sh yeah, sheltering the DNA may be good because, you know, yeah. bacteria have... Restriction enzymes. Restriction CRISPR, enzymes. Yeah. So Alio's title for the episode is, Do, Did Eukaryotes Invent Anything? It's <laughs> <laughs> <That's good. laughs> so cool. And this is so... It's an obscure pseudomonas, an obscure phage. If you wrote a grant, they would say, no way, what are we going to learn? Exactly. And here you go. This is just another example of let people do what they want. There you go. We can't afford that anymore. So I think the origin of viruses is really cool. But if anyone else has well, ideas. I, let's I ask. was thinking of something narrower, and that is, do we really understand how super infection exclusion works? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, if we have some mechanisms, I'm not really aware of them. But, I, you know, how does the virus sense it right from the get-go? Or, you know, I don't know. It's just mm -hmm. So are new viruses evolving as we speak that we haven't identified yet and that are out there waiting for us to discover them? You mean new in the sense that we've never seen anything like it? Or right. is it one of the seven genome types? No, it's something that we've never seen. Like the Mimi viruses that suddenly huge, appeared. Huge virus. Right? No, that was new. That was huge, right? Sure. Yeah. Hmm. Are there bigger viruses than Mimi viruses? We're inside one. <laughs> so, you know, someone um, 
Nels Eldi told me there are no known viruses of tetrahymena. What? Hmm. How about that? Nobody's looked hard enough. So you know what Nels is doing? Looking. He's, he's, he's got a pond in his backyard. <laughs> sure. He seeded it with tetrahymena. Ow. You didn't have to do that. They were there already. <laughs> <laughs> and he's checking for viruses. <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah. I think that's great. Yep. I think I think the basically the whole immune system I would put in unexplained phenomena because there is mm-hmm. so much going on with that that mm-hmm. um, even just from a viral perspective that we don't understand. Do we understand why half our genome is transposable? Transposable elements, so. but that's not viral, that, of course. I don't. I don't know if uh, if why is a good question there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. We shouldn't ask why. Yeah, what, but which, what's in, the in immunity, what I was thinking of is things like correlates of immunity for different viruses and why they vary so much. Mm-hmm. You know, why why is an antibody response perfectly adequate against measles, but completely inadequate against um, dozens of other viruses? And and it, it's just. Uh, there, there is an enormous amount going on in immunology that we haven't even scratched the surface of. Mm. Well, if anyone out there in uh, listener land has ideas, send them in. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's uh, we could yeah. we can seed a whole bunch of uh, research grants by people sending in <laughs> ideas for uh, these. Uh, sort of, what are we calling them? Unexplained phenomena. Unexplained phenomena in virology here, right? Yeah. I'm going to limit it to virology. All right. This reminds me of that great quote that the uh, the earth-shaking moments in science are not marked by somebody saying eureka, but by saying that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this uh, green stuff kills that yellow stuff. Yeah. yeah. What's that about? Um, penicillin. We have a snippet in a paper for our listeners today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, coincidentally, actually, it's not really coincidentally, but I decided to do this. They're both papers on the kind of virus I have spent most of my career working on, but coronaviruses. So don't go away. They're both really good. (laughs) Snippet has to do with the polio vaccine that would be used after eradication occurs. And we all know we're close to eradicating polio. And we're going to need a vaccine after that time because you can't eliminate the possibility of an outbreak, either from laboratories who have unknown stocks or presence of viruses in the environment that we haven't detected and so forth. Long-term excretors. Long-term excretors. And so there, we have actually, I think, talked of a, about a few or at least one other approach to a post-eradication polio vaccine. Um, I think, yes. So it was from the same group, uh, which involved using the Sabin strains of polio to produce an activated polio vaccine. Because currently, an activated polio vaccine is produced using virulent strains, which will be very difficult in the post-eradication era to do. Yes. It have to be done in a high containment. And this, uh, other people have different approaches as well. This one... When they're, it, when they're, when they're talking about that problem... Yes. Uh, ...in this paper, in the introduction... They're talking about having to make the inactivated uh, vaccine from wild-type strains. I love the their terminology. They say this will include IPV production where colossal amounts of virus are grown. <laughs> yeah, I mark that, I too. I, love I don't think I've ever yeah. seen colossal used quantitatively. Except on the outside of an olive can. <laughs> colossal olive? Yeah, they have. Well, now we have colossal. The colossal olives. size olives. There are two olives in each can. Yeah, so the problem is that when you make so much, uh, you, you may infect someone at some point or release it by accident. Mm. So you probably don't want to do that with virulent strains in a era where not vaccinating anyone any longer. Yeah. Uh, there is another approach that I want to just mention. This has been discussed on TWIV because um, it involves changing the codons for protein coding regions of viruses. And we've we've talked about that in terms of what's actually happening. Is it that dinucleotide frequency? Is it the codon frequency, et cetera? But Eckhard Wimmer and his colleagues have used that to produce attenuated viruses that are infectious with very little likelihood of reversion because there are thousands of changes in those genomes. 
And today uh, we have a paper uh, from the National Institute of Biological Standards and Control in Potter's Bar, Hertfordshire, United Kingdom. And I say Hertfordshire on purpose because years ago, Phil Miner, who's on this paper, I told him, what, what is this Hertfordshire place? <laughs> he said, Vincent. Vincent, do I say Arkansas? Because <laughs> I said to him, why is it Hertfordshire when you, print, when you spell it Hertfordshire? He says, well, why is Arkansas not Arkansas? Well, He's such about, a sharp guy. How about Worcestershire sauce? Yes. <laughs> so this Worc- is the division Worcester, of Worcester, Massachusetts, so, or right. Pug- Puget Sound out on the West Coast. Exactly. Yeah. So NIBSC is kind of like the uh, FDA of the UK. They, they make sure every biological that goes out is is, is proper. Stand and uh, the authors are Helen Fox, Sarah Nolson, Phil Miner, and Andrew McAdam, who or McAdam, who um, uh, were involved in the last study uh, of making IPV from Sabin strains. So this is PLOS pathogens, just published yesterday, Thursday. Genetically thermostabilized immunogenic poliovirus empty capsids, a strategy for non-replicating vaccines. So the idea is, can you make a safe vaccine in the post-eradication era? And if you have to grow virus, one could argue that it's never going to be safe. But here, if you could make an empty capsid Indeed. with no infectious material in it, um, you could do that, of course, right? Now, yeah. yes, sir. Was someone about to say something? No, I just said, yeah. <laughs> so Not me. The problem with empty capsids, and people years ago, I think 20 years ago, people showed you could just produce empty capsids in insect cells or in yeast by inserting the right DNAs in them. They're very unstable, totally unsuitable for vaccine use. So here they've, they've addressed this question in a really elegant way by identifying mutations in the capsid that make empty capsids very stable, right? So the way poliomorphogenesis occurs is the capsid subunits are produced in infected cells. As a precursor, they're cleaved by a protease. They assemble into a shell, probably concomitantly with the RNA binding to one of the subunits. But in infected cells, you do get lots of empty capsids produced, and that's what they take advantage of in this study to ask, can we make an empty capsid that's stable? And so... They start with an observation that the Sabin-3 strain of polio has a change uh, in the capsid coding region uh, that interferes with, not with the stability of the capsid, but with the assembly of the capsid. And there have been many reversions of this mutation over the years identified, either at the site or at second sites. And they introduce all of these into first the type 3, then the type 2, and then the type 1 uh, wild-type strains to see if they will stabilize, further stabilize the viruses. They also uh, do experiments where they passage, or I should say passage, because that would be the proper (laughs) pronunciation. They passage viruses at higher and higher temperatures to select for additional mutations that would stabilize the empty capsids. And what they can do is infect cells. And when you run the the virus particles on a gradient, uh, you get empty capsids, in a separate peak from full capsids with genomes in them. And they can purify the empty capsids. They can immunize animals and ask uh, whether they make an immune response and whether that is protective or not. Now, since this is a snippet, I don't want to go through all the, the details of the mutations. But but since it's open access, you, you can, can go look you yourself. You can go look at it. I would just want to say that the goal here was to make thermally stable empty capsids because the empty capsids made in a typical polio infection, if you heat them, they pop they pop apart in no time. And you can tell that because the antigenicity changes. You can, and you don't have to heat them that much. You don't. This and, is, this, yeah, so this they're, is a fundamental problem if they're you modif- the vaccine. They're modified capsids. What they end up with, with a number of mutations in them, uh, convert, uh, they fall apart, and they measure that by conversion of the antigenicity um, at 54, 56, and 55 degrees Celsius compared to 36, 42, and 33 for the wild type strain. So they've substantially improved the thermostability of these uh, by introducing a variety of mutations. And they show that in rats, uh, these are highly immunogenic, these empty capsids. Um, the thermostable variants cause seroconversion in all the animals at all doses that they give to the animals. Uh, when the responses in animals given the normal uh, IPV, around 50% response. So these are much more immunogenic than the equivalent 
components made from inactivated poliovirus vaccine. Uh, and then they, they do a challenge experiment. They take uh, transgenic mice carrying the human receptor for poliovirus, which I'm proud to say were also produced here at Columbia many, many years ago. Um, they were immunized with one or two da- doses of empty capsid purified on a gradient. This is not recombinant capsid. This is purified on a gradient. But presumably in the future you would make this in, in recombinant ways without any viral genomes present. Then they challenged them uh, with poliovirus, one, two, or three, depending on what they are immunized with. Um, in all cases, the stabilized capsid, one or two doses were more immunogenic than IPV and protected all the animals from challenge with the corresponding virulent virus. So this is like a, a proof of concept. You can make a more thermostable capsid, capsid empty capsid, which is uh, as immunogenic as the unmodified capsid in which protects against challenge in, an, in a mouse model. Now, the real issue here is licensing and regulation of this vaccine or any new vaccine against polio. Because as we've discussed previously on this show, TWIV, you can't do an, a human efficacy trial. You can do a safety trial, but not efficacy because there's not enough polio left in the world to do that. And we talked about it last time, and Phil Miner actually... Uh, listen to our discussion. No doubt uh, he was told to listen by Andrew, <laughs> who's far younger than Phil and more likely to listen to podcasts. And uh, Phil said, well, why can't they just license it because it's immunogenic and you know has the same protection profile in animals and so forth? And it turns out that, in fact, China and Japan have licensed Sabin-based IPV already wow. without an efficacy trial. Um. And they provide some other examples of vaccines, human vaccines that have been licensed without efficacy trial, based solely on immunogenicity trials, right? So you can show in people right. it gives rise to the same immune responses. So I don't know what will happen. I have a feeling in the U.S. Uh, the FDA will never do that, but I could be wrong. Well, if this, this is licensed in, in other countries and gets used for a few years, um, that could become the clinical trial. Yeah, but there's no polio. That's the problem, right? Yes, um, I mean, if they use this in countries where there is polio and show that it works, maybe, yeah. But I'm thinking this would be a post-eradication vaccine, right? So, right. In which case, you could use you, you wouldn't be using it until you had an outbreak, right? Right. The, the FDA is going to have to come to grips with this because this is <laughs> this is not uh, this is going to be uh, becoming a not uncommon problem. It reminds me of the problem with uh, licensing the getting approved the antipox viral drug st246 yes. that's been yep. dragging on forever and ever because uh you can't do the experiments in humans there's no natural disease so that's where this idea of a two animal model came up is that yep. still uh, not licensed uh, Rich? as far as i know that is still not licensed wow. uh, they, they right. need to come up with a distinct process for vaccines against diseases that just aren't happening right now Right. At the other end of the spectrum is something like the Ebola situation where, you know, in the waning days of it, you could do ring vaccination. But then after that, when there's hardly any cases, it's it, how are you going to figure out things like that? Right. Well, that's damn, all, that damn one, you, Coke posture. That one is also a problem. The Ebola vaccines, yeah. you know, um, yeah. not clear that the FDA would license it. But uh, right. hearing about this smallpox antiviral issue could be a problem but as and rich for, says yeah they should come to grips with it <laughs> they, no, they're gonna they, have to ideally what you do with something like this is once you've determined safety and antigenicity um you would simply incorporate it in one of the multiple um so you know the multiple component vaccines that we already have so it would remain part of the ongoing mm-hmm. immunization i don't have a lot of hope that that'll happen but i think that would be great because then you would have ongoing herd immunity and you wouldn't have to go you know shipping crates of this stuff into some disaster zone all of a sudden because oh my gosh we've got polio 20 years from now you know if go ahead well no go ahead i have a different thought i mean it's along a different line the uh there are plenty of viruses out there that don't cause a lot of infections but against which we want vaccines i saw an article yesterday on the bbc that three vaccines are being fast-tracked nipa MERS and one other I can't remember, and there's certainly 
I don't know if it was SARS or something else, but you know, you're going to have to, at some point, say if you want to protect people against future outbreaks, you're going to have to license this on what you have, right? Right. Okay. Go ahead, Kathy. Well, so I was just going to kind of recap. In addition to this being more stable, what we haven't particularly addressed is that it might be possible to avoid the cold chain for giving out this vaccine, and that mm-hmm. would be an advantage. Yep. Um, yes. We mentioned that it's more immunogenic, and of course, it avoids having to grow the infectious virus, right. which is a major improvement. Right, so this would have right. to be done in, in a recombinant system, a baculovirus or a yeast or whatever. So, But they've proven that you can make more thermostable immunogenic empty capsid, so they had to do this before yeah, moving on. Uh, looking so I really want to I I take ahead, it even Rich. a step further, okay? Huh? Uh, because we talked... Um, uh, a few weeks ago, I can't seem to locate the paper of the episode. We talked about this uh, idea of uh, there was an RNA vaccine that was delivered uh, as a nanoparticle. And the vaccine consisted of, it was an alpha virus-like or an alpha virus platform where um, there's a subgenomic RNA that uh, normally contains ta- capsid proteins has been replaced with the antigen, so it gets amplified, uh, and so you get a, a big slug of uh, uh, um, antigen synthesis. So I wonder if these VLPs might not be assembled properly under those conditions, and you couldn't just administer this thing uh, as a nanoparticle. And uh, As the RNA, you mean? As the RNA, yeah, you'd have to include the protease RNA as well because you need the protease to process the precursor so that it will assemble into a capsid, which might work. So can you? Uh, okay. So you the the capsids have to be start off with a precursor. That's yeah, because can you they exp- fold. They seem to fold as they're nascently translated. as the precursor. Yeah. Okay. So if you make individual capsids, they don't assemble properly. Like All right. BP one two three four doesn't work. All right. Okay. I, okay. I, I I wanted to remind listeners that we have other of these kinds of vaccines, virus-like particle vaccines. Yes. For instance, the human papillomavirus and hepatitis B are licensed, and others are in development. For instance, for influenza, parvovirus, and norovirus. So this already has been tested in concept with these other virus types. So it's a, a good viral platform for vaccines. Yeah. Looking at the the really, really big picture, though, I kind of wonder if it might make sense at some point, uh, maybe not while I'm still alive, but at some point down in the future, (laughs) there may be a point where we want to go to a proactive approach to vaccine development instead of the reactive approach that we've had for the past century. Um, So instead of saying, look, here's a disease that's hurting and killing a lot of people, let's develop a vaccine against it say, hey, you know, we discovered this virus that can spill over into people occasionally. Let's develop a vaccine against that and then make a version of it, either an empty capsid or a nanoparticle or something that we can incorporate in a multi-component vaccine that would just be your anti-future pandemic shot. Um, Protect as many people as possible against these types of events before these types of events even occur. So you mentioned something that you show spills over occasionally into people. That That's the key, how you get that. Right. Well, uh, we've known about Zika virus since the 40s, right? And now yeah. all of a sudden we're, we're really freaking out about it and rushing to develop vaccines. What if we had a program where we said, hey, you know, there's this virus, the Zika virus. We know it can get into people. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's all that bad, but who knows? Um, toss that into the mix with your... Um, your other flavy viruses that you've developed vaccines against, and mm. then this never happens. I'll tell you one reason why it's not happening. Oh, one, I know it. One word: but money. Money. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to imitate someone. I didn't do a very good job. No, you need Alec Baldwin. For that. Alec Baldwin. One, <laughs> one other thing in the discussion of this paper, they mentioned that the work was performed as part of a consortium whose members are given under the acknowledgments. The consortium is following other approaches for finding capsid stabilizing mutations. Um, and also it's mentioned a little bit later that part of the consortium is working on how to produce this as a viable vaccine 
uh, what you were mentioning, Vincent, about how this would be made maybe in baculovirus or yeast or something like that. And so when I followed through to that, um, the very first group that's mentioned is uh, that of uh, Dave Rollins. So I wrote to him um, to give him a heads up because I know he listens to TWIV. (laughs) And he wrote back and said, I'm the PI on the WHO grant that has funded us for the past five to six years. Andy's paper is great. I hope you agree. A student of mine and Nick Stonehouse had a related paper in Journal of Virology online last month. And another lab in the consortium, George Lomonosov at the John Innes Center, has another under consideration. All in all, we're very pleased with the progress. And then he says, Happy New Year to you all, despite current events. Dave. Despite current events. What is that, a, a monsoon, Dixon? <laughs> not really. No, that's no. not current. Um, I, I like this cartoon that someone pasted into the show notes. This is just fabulous. The XICD, yeah. yeah. I've seen this before. This is great. I love yeah. it. I pasted it in. Would you? I have it on my Kath, wow. Kathy, if you got zapped, would you pull the lever again? Probably. <laughs> 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 For those who uh, want to look it up, it's XKCD uh, number 242. How the scientist responds. I, I to think a I've zap. actually, I think I've actually more or less enacted this um, on, on at least one occasion while working on some electronic equipment. <laughs> Does that feel that way? I want to welcome a new sponsor to Twiv. Blue do. Blue Apron. They, their mission, by the way, is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone, while supporting a more sustainable food system setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. I thought Dixon would like this sustainable food system, right? No, fine. Absolutely. And I th- So I get to pick our advertisers, of course. I don't accept every ad that, that's uh, pitched at us. And I thought, you know, CuriosityStream was a no-brainer because we all like interesting science videos. This one, well, we're busy. And if you don't have a lot of time to cook, I love eating, but... I don't, I don't like to spend a lot of time gathering ingredients to cook something. But here, Blue Apron will give it all to you in a box. Oh, this is so cool. And I've tried it out. And as you'll hear, Kathy has as well. We'll let you know about it. But basically, they deliver seasonal rep- recipes with fresh, high-quality ingredients so you can make delicious home-cooked meals. Every meal comes in a box with step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card, pre-portioned ingredients, 40 minutes or less. They give you everything you need except... Salt, pepper, and oil, and even little spices that you may not have, they give you enough so you don't have to buy a whole bottle of it. And they're fresh spices, not like those old ones that you might have in your spice cabinet. (laughs) You spend a lot of eating out uh, or at high-end grocery chains, which will not be mentioned here. You can spend (laughs) under $10 per person for making a healthy home-cooked meal, and the portions are controlled, so you're not going to overeat. You won't have leftovers, Dixon, okay? Or it won't. You won't don't be, have too many leftovers. In our you won't house. be tempted to have a second portion because there aren't second portions. Right. Uh, they set very high quality standards for. They have a community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers all across the U.S. that they use to source their materials. Mm-hmm. Seafood, for example, sourced under standards, sustainable standards developed together with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. That's a big deal. Uh, beef, chicken, and pork come from responsibly raised animals. Produce, this is what Dixon is interested in, (laughs) is from farms that practice regenerative farming. And one day, Dixon, they'll be from vertical farms, I bet. I'm sure you're right. And they ship exactly as how much you need for a recipe. They reduce food waste. Right. Now, you can customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences. You can choose a delivery option. There's no weekly commitment. You only get what you want. And, of course, they'll delivered to 99% of the continental U.S., except Austin, Texas. No, 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 just kidding. I was just going to ask. <laughs> of this course. sounds good. I'm, you, know. you can choose from a variety of new recipes every week, or you can let them surprise you. When I, so a week ago today, I received on a Friday uh, two family meals, which will feed four people each, and I got chicken souvlaki with uh, grilled broccoli and uh Meyer lemon rice, and then I got uh, crispy salmon with, um, I think there were grilled potatoes and Meyer lemon aioli. Oh, man, they were so good. And I started actually preparing them. I was very excited to do this. Uh, unfortunately, I had to stop and bring my son somewhere. So when I got back, it was all done. My wife said it was very easy mm-hmm. to do. She's a really good cook, and um, 
She said the best part is that you get exactly what you need and you don't have to go out and buy and run, collect other things. Here are some other recipes. They never repeat a recipe within a year. Spicy shrimp and Korean rice cakes with cabbage and furikake. Pork chops and garlic piccata with scallion rice and spinach. Cashew chicken stir fry with tango mandarins and jasmine rice. You getting hungry, Dixon? Yes, indeed. <laughs> I'm they totally signing have, up for this. <laughs> they also have a lot of vegetarian options that are really good. I've been doing it for almost two years. I don't do it every week. I do it on average maybe once every three weeks. Mm -hmm. I figure it out based on my schedule when I'm going to be here, when I'm going to be going out to dinner anyway, and things like that. But yeah, I love it. So I found that the materials were really fresh, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the chicken and the salmon were we're fresh potatoes, broccoli that we, that came with it. You know, it's all the right amount you get. It's really, really beautiful. Uh, you can check out this week's menu and get your free. You can get your first three meals free. Free shipping, free meals. Go to blueapron.com slash twiv, blueapron.com slash twiv, and you can sign up. And uh, three, your first three meals will be free. You'll you'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Check it out. Free Blue food, Apron. everybody. Free food. <laughs> free food. That's <laughs> going to be is. huge with our, with our group, I think. I, I had free food offers for Blue Apron to some friends, and I sent them to them, and they said, oh, no thanks. We don't think we want to try it. And I was like, it's, it's three <laughs> it's, free meals. Why would It's free you food delivered to your door. <laughs> and right. really, Kathy, an hour at most, right, to prepare? Oh, less than an hour. Yeah. yeah. I, I almost have, always have everything cleaned up by the time I sit down to eat. So, and for me, because I'm mostly cooking for myself, sometimes I'll make it for my brother in town, but uh, I, it's definitely enough for leftovers for another meal. And so that works out well. And one thing is that all of the shipping materials are recyclable. You can empty out the freezer packets and so forth, or you can, there's all kinds of information on their website. website. Uh, you can even send stuff back to them to recycle. Uh, when it says grilled this or that, does that mean you grill it? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You, you do all the cooking. You get raw materials, right, Kathy? Right. They don't, they don't ever have you do anything in a microwave. It's always in a nonstick pan if you have one and things in the oven sometimes. I enjoyed it. I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to this weekend. I don't know what I'm getting, but it uh, should be there when I get home. It's Friday. Right. should be on the front step. Right. And uh, maybe even tonight. Maybe do even it, tonight. You know, we get now since all the kids are back at school. Three, uh, two-person meals. All right, Blue Apron, a better way to cook. I like it. We have a paper for you. This is also on picornaviruses. I thought that uh, would be nice to focus on picornaviruses. <laughs> just you know, I had out a few other papers to pick, but. I just picked this one. Must be feeling kind of uh, melancholy. <laughs> no, I'm not feeling melancholy. For not for this reason. For other reasons. <gasps> oh, okay. There's a paper, a letter in Nature. It's called PLA 2G16, which is no way to say that shortly or interestingly. Or uh, it just 16. rolls right off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> Plot 2G16 <laughs> <laughs> represents a switch between entry and clearance of D. This comes from uh, the Netherlands. Cancer Institute uh, in the Netherlands, Amsterdam, of course, virology at uh, uh, Utrecht University, where I, I've been there, uh, Stanford University, and uh, the uh, research center in Vienna, and uh, another cancer institute in the in the Netherlands. First author is Jacqueline Starring, and some of the authors that I know here include Frank von Kupeveld, who I I just talked to. Last Sunday, I taught a class he was teaching in Cardiff uh, about blogging. I was telling them how to blog. And Frank said, how do you pick your papers? <laughs> said, well, Frank, <laughs> I pick interesting things, and here you go. Here's One at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I also know Jan Carette uh, and Thin Brummelkamp. Hmm. Now, what they do here is to ask uh, what, what cell genes are important for coronavirus replication. And by the way, this this is another paper from the No Introduction School of Paper Writing. There's <laughs> uh, the abstract, and then they start off to identify picornavirus host factors, mutagenized HAP1 cells, yada yada yada. Yeah, that's the so, typical Nature letter, though, right? Exactly. It's they are very very space constrained, and it makes for 
it, it can make for difficult reading. Uh, this is also not open access, so probably some listeners are not going to be reading the paper anyway. But uh, but if you do go and get it, just you know, strap yourself in to unpack everything because it's been very <laughs> well compressed. Well, basically, every sentence in this paper is loaded with results and. They're just strung together and makes it very difficult. And, and is a, was probably a month's work, yeah. You know, I, I don't know why it has to be so space-constrained. I think uh, letting a paper journal dictate that these days is absurd. But nature, you know, continues to want this format. They make you take out everything. You know, the, the paper I was telling you before uh, about this virus-induced uh, nucleus in a bacterium, that was published in Science, and they wouldn't let the authors speculate at the end. They took it all out because there wasn't any space. Yeah. It seems absurd. That's the whole point of a paper with provocative results, right? A lot of these journals operate <laughs> simultaneously in the 13th and 21st centuries. Shame <laughs> on you, nature. They've got these standards of how the page is going to be done, and it's it's very, very old. And yet they want to talk about the latest research. Yeah. And, uh, and they're strapped into a business model that, prevents them from easily changing some aspects of that so it's a it's a hard problem to solve well i'll tell you this one was tough going it is tough yes. going. because of all this this was really a slog we'll try we'll do our best here in the in the two minutes we have left right Dixon? Hey. right <laughs> um right because we're space constrained we are we are exactly. space constrained exactly see see po- podcasts are open-ended yep. we, we go for two hours but we could all right so basically they use a uh, a genome-wide genetic screen which involves infecting haploid cells. And that's what um, uh, thin bromocomp is known for, this haploid cell line, which has been used by many people, including Sean Whalen, to identify virus receptors, for example. You can infect these with retroviruses under conditions where you get one integration per cell, and you can then you'll disrupt the gene because it's haploid. Now you have... The, the only copy knocked out. And then you can infect with viruses and see which genes uh, are important. So that's what they do here. They take these haploid cells and and uh, uh, infect them with retroviruses to knock out individual genes. Then they infect them with different picornaviruses, my favorite viruses of all time, including <laughs> polio, coxsackie of different types, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, enterovirus A71. And the way you do this, you do this multiple times, and then you have to uh, take the resistant cells and find out where the retrovirus is integrated. You have to sequence, and and you present the data in terms of genes and um, how how many times you you get that gene hit. And you get these these interesting plots where there are lots of circles, very low down on the y-axis, and then a few stand up. And for polio, of course, the poliovirus receptor stands way out. It's the receptor. If you knock it out, the gene encoding it, you don't get infection, right? So for each of these four viruses, they identify the receptor, but they also identify a second protein in common to all of them. Knocking it out prevents infection by all, and that's PLA2G16, the virus, uh, the the name that we cannot pronounce. (laughs) Not, not the name that shall not be said, but the name that we cannot pronounce. The name that cannot be said. (laughs) The name that cannot be said. It's a common host protein needed... And this encodes a small phospholipase that is implicated in obesity. Interesting. Is your interest peaked, Dixon? I'm trying to get you involved here. You look it's, tired. It's been peaked. It's been a long day? Uh, no, I'm, not, I'm okay. not particularly tired. I'm particularly interested at this moment. I'm, I'm knitting. So a, my, phospho, my a phospholipase is something that essentially degrades lipids, right? Correct. Degrades lipids. That's right. That's right. So, so that'll, that'll degrade membranes. And if you knock this out in, but I, I, it, in mice, if you knock it out, you get fat. Oh no no no! <laughs> you don't get fat. No, that's you, leptin. That, that's they got this in the supplementary data. Right, right. Mm-hmm. If you put put mice on a high fat diet, um, the wild type mice get obese, and the guys with this knocked out don't. Right. They also show that um, if you restore production of this protein by putting in a cDNA encoding the gene it restores um, susceptibility to infection and that that if you if you alter the catalytic site cysteine of the protein that altered protein will not rescue so it tells you that enzymatically active plot 2 G uh, is important and they can also do this in other cell lines using CRISPR they can disrupt the gene in HeLa cells hec 293 ts a549 
and show that uh, it leads to resistance of these viruses in a, in a variety of cells. They also made mice that are deficient in PLA2G16. Uh, fibroblasts from them are resistant to Coxsackie infection, and the uh, animals are also uh, resistant to infection. You know, with wild type animals get for Coxsackie, they they get para- paralysis and die, uh, but the uh, knockout animals are, are resistant. No signs of illness. So you, without this gene, you never get fat, and you don't get sick from picornaviruses. So let's all get rid of it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but we haven't taken these mice to we haven't taken these what, mice to the opera yet. That's right. You no. might not. You might not yeah. enjoy operas. Yeah. They didn't say anything about whether those mice were otherwise okay. So the real question is now: What is it doing? So they do a bunch of experiments. Uh, for example, they take fluorescently labeled polio virus and they infect cells uh, with that. And they also have a fluorescently labeled PLA2G16 gene, and they put them in cells together. And you can see in infected cells, you get foci of the of the virus and the pro and this protein together, right? Foci of fluorescence, and they're near each other. The virus and uh, plot two G sixteen. Yes, sir. I want to back up for just a second because yep. there's one little bit we missed, and that is it's specific for picornaviruses. Yeah, they, they tried, uh, tried adeno, other- herpes, influenza, VSV, and the the knockout is susceptible. Damn, to Damn, you know, I, I just viruses. missed that sentence. <laughs> I read right past it. Uh, it's a little miss a lot in this paper. That's the density of the data here. Lordy. All right, so uh, apparently this protein goes near where the viruses are coming in. Um, now, when um, when when viruses uh, infect, when these viruses infect cells, they have to get out of the endosome, and so that the idea is that a pore is produced in the endosome. So they they ask whether this protein is uh, responsible for pore formation, and they have an assay where they have a toxin alpha sarsin which inactivates ribosomes, and when you make pores, this makes the cells sensitive to that, but. Uh, they find that, in fact, this gene la- lack of this gene, PLA2G16, is not needed for permeabilization of the membrane. So it's not actually forming the pores itself, which was a reasonable hypothesis, but it's not it. All right, next. But they're still trying to find out what this protein is doing. Uh, we know that picornaviruses, um, when they infect cells, they, gener- they induce the formation of intracellular membrane vesicles that are used for RNA replication. Um, Cells lacking PLA2G16 don't have these viral replication sites. So that suggests that this protein acts sometime after pore formation, but before or maybe at the same time uh, as replication. Uh, They do some experiments to look at this. They have a virus that has to replicate to uh, become fluorescent, and they don't see any fluorescence in cells lacking PLA2G16. But if they put the genome in cells... They see infection in these knockout cells. So the RNA can get in cells and replicate through the whole infectious cycle in the absence of PLA2G16. So it tells you that somehow it's the capsid, the RNA getting out of the capsid and into the cell uh, that's being um, blocked when you don't have PLA2G16. That to me is a really uh, cool and critical experiment. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this PLA2G, you don't need for viral RNA replication. It's something having to do with a capsid. Right. Yeah, that's very. And they say it's involved somehow in the delivery of the genome to the cytoplasm. All right. So, now. The, so the virus gets in in the endosomes. Right. You get in or, it ordinarily in order to get out, it's got to make holes in the endosomes. Right. The holes get made. Okay. Uh, if the RNA could get out, it would be replicated, but it's not being replicated. So there's exactly. something in between making the initial holes and setting up replication sites. Right. Right. Now, next, they did a really cool thing, is they said, can we now take these cells lacking PLA2G16 and mutate them further and find other genes that would suppress the defect? It's a we suppress two papers with suppression here. Yes. <laughs> That's First right. one yeah. used suppressors of TS to get stability mutations. Mm-hmm. This is using suppressors of this That's right. to find out the pathway. Wow. Just a, an extraordinary Common technique. Theme. Common theme. And- and also just the genetics. So the idea of putting in the wild type PLA2G16 gene in the cells that are mutant for it and reestablishing the wild type phenotype in addition to these experiments that we're just now describing are just 
classical genetic approaches oh, yeah. that I like. Absolutely. So um, they have um, these, these PLA2G null cells. They mutagenize them with, with a, again, with an insertion uh, approach. And, uh, and someone has put in a description of that. I don't know. Is that you, Rich? The gene uh, no, somebody else did that. I oh, I put that up, in. Though. Yeah. That, yeah. It's basically a. You want to talk about it, or and that's all right. Okay. I think yeah. we don't have to go that deep. Basically, they've mutagenized these cells a second time, uh, and they uh, they identify other mutations in other genes that now allow viruses to grow in Pla two G null cells. And, and they, they they mutagenize them in a way that allows them to find yeah the mutations easily. Mm-hmm. So, what genes were suppressing this uh, mutation? They're in they're in genes involved. In autophagy, membrane trafficking, and glycosylation, and um, the one they focused on is called L- LGAL S8. That we can pronounce LGAL S8, <laughs> also known as Galactin 8, a gene product previously linked to clearance of bacteria by by autophagy. Autophagy, the process by which uh, vesicles inside a cell uh, get digested. They gave a Nobel Prize for that recently. It did. Yes. It did. <coughs> Someone who figured it out in yeast, right? Yep. Uh, so this is a lectin, L-gal S8, binds carbohydrates. And when, when bacteria are growing in cells, they make pores uh, in the vacuoles, and um, they expose glycans that aren't normally exposed, and they bind this, this protein, and that helps to clear the bacteria. So it's kind of a, it's a protein involved in response to danger including bacterial infection, and maybe here in viral infection as well. So they produce a GFP-labeled L-gal S8 in cells lacking PLA2G16, and then they infect them, and they see cytoplasmic foci of this uh, L-gal S8 protein within minutes after infection. So it's responding to virus infection. This is in the absence of PLA2G16. Um, so then they make cells, HeLa cells, having muta- either single or double mutations in PLA2G, LGAL S8, or another protein uh, encoded by the gene ATG7, which is essential for autophagy. And then they infect them with their, their coronaviruses. And loss of either LGAL S8 or ATG7 restores infection in delta PLA2G16 cells. I know this is getting a little tough, but basically you can suppress <laughs> so removing... PLA2G16 prevents infection with these coronaviruses. You can restore that by deleting either LGAL S8 or ATG7. ATG7 you need for autophagy. So this is telling us that somehow autophagy is involved in this process of allowing infection. Virus-induced LGAL S8 recruitment. Is everybody with us so far? Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. I have to read this 500 times to get it. (laughs) You're making it very clear for me. Dixon, that's just wonderful. Thank you so much. (laughs) That's true. Would you like a drink? Sure, you bet. <laughs> all right, so this is all this data are suggesting that uh, LGAL S8 and PLA2G16 are interacting in some way. They tried to characterize that further. Right. I don't want to actually talk about these results so much because that's so interesting. Um, basically, uh, certain parts of each protein are important for um, this, this, this interaction. Um, one of the key points is that there's a part of... Um, uh, LGAL S8, that's a carbohydrate recognition domain, and this is really important for this phenotype. And uh, in addition, when you shock cells, uh, PLA2G16 makes distinct cyto- cytoplasmic foci. So not just virus infection, but just shock, hypotonic shock, um, causes this to accumulate. So it's some kind of response to shock, and LGAL uh, LS8 is not needed for that. All right, so what is the function of one protein on the other. So they did an autophagy assay. And uh, during autophagy, a a protein called LC3 is cleaved. It forms a very characteristic cleavage product. So they develop an assay to measure that. Uh, And basically they find that... uh, So LGAL S8 is involved in triggering autophagy. And um, this this does not require PLA2G16. So the induction of autophagy mediated by LGAL S8 is independent of PLA2G16. Uh, six, plot two G sixteen. All right, so we're almost done now. It's the last set of experiments. <clears throat> they now uh, wanted to see where the viral genome 
is is in cells that uh, have one or the other deletion. So in either a wild-type cell or cells lacking plot to G16, you infect them with virus. The genomes are first found at the plasma membrane, and then they get internalized. So they're looking at the genome um, in these experiments. Um, in wild-type cells, most of the foci of LGAL S8 don't have viral genomes in them. Okay. In contrast, in, in cells lacking plot to G16, most of the foci of LGAL S8 did contain viral genomes. So the, the suggestion here is that somehow plot to G16 is facilitating the displacement of the genome from the vesicles. The vesicles contain LGAL S8. Okay. Now LGAL S8 would normally promote autophagy, but plot to G16 helps the RNA get out of the vesicle before uh, everything can be digested. So and, you have one host factor that would normally stop the infection from happening by preventing the virus from getting the genome in, but then another host factor comes along and helps out the virus. <clears throat> right. So L, a P, plot 2 G16 somehow helps the RNA get out of the vesicle, right? Right. Do you Where think it, that's related to its uh, lipase activity at all? Oh, that's a good all? question. Because we know that the enzymatic activity of, of uh, plot 2 G16 is needed, right? If you It's required. Out. So I don't that know. It certainly, certainly makes sense that uh, they, they, I mean, the, the, the pores do get formed. In the but maybe they, okay. yeah, maybe they get enough. enlarged or Correct. something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And you want to know the substrate, right? And, and see how that's uh, affecting. That would be really interesting. Yeah. And, and they don't know. They speculate on all kinds of things. But part of their speculation is the notion that, uh, yeah, it's enlarging pores or doing something to the endosome to assist in getting the genome out. Right. Right. So plot 2G16 helps the genome get out. If you take away plot 2G16, then. LGGAL, LGAL S8 drives the, the endosome to autophagy and everything's digested with the RNA so you don't get infection. You take away LGAL S8, you don't get autophagy. The RNA can get out and, and it can replicate. And they do an experiment showing that the RNA is translated um, uh, in, in L cells lacking plot to G16. You, the RNA doesn't get translated well. Uh, and if you take away uh, the other protein, it does. So, so two opposing mechanisms. Very interesting. Yes. And so one I, of the, I have a okay. question. Does 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 um to end autophagy is not the default end pathway for endosomes, right? Is it only I mean, only if you have shock? Okay. So so the autophagy system, if you like, uh, via LGAL S eight, is probably recognizing these. Uh, virus containing endosomes as mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not good. That's right. Maybe maybe because we of the pore formation. Of maybe yes. Maybe the membrane right. damage. They suggest that. So that would be a kind of shock, right? Virus infection right. form pores, right. right? Right. But then so, plot two G sixteen is bypassing that, and what would normally undergo autophagy gets let out. Right. Right. And and in the in a in, if you're only missing plot two G sixteen and you can't get the RNA out, then those endosomes that are marked as bad get uh, shunted into autophagy and degraded. But if yep. that pathway is compromised, right. those bad endosomes can stick around long enough yep. so that eventually you get RNA in the side. Eventually the RNA leaks out or whatever. You got it. Exactly. Yeah. And and they, um, they point out this interesting phenomenon in the paper that some picornaviruses have one of their proteins, the 2A protein, um, is homologous to PLA 2G16. Right. Helps, probably helps the RNA get out, right? probably serves a similar function. Very interesting. And, um, I mean, I, I would suspect that if you looked at the native hosts of those viruses, you might find something like the PLA 2G16 in those species is not yeah, doing this point. job. And so the good virus point. had to had to make up for it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the virus even <clears throat> somehow picked this up from yeah. cells. So I wonder if those viruses would not care if PLAT2G is missing from these, like in these cells that they use right. here, you know? That's a good point. They, uh, they, the other virus that they mention is uh, adeno-associated virus, mm -hmm. where one of the capsid proteins has a domain that in fact looks like and has phospholipase activity. And so there's probably a virus, in that yeah, case, yeah. probably a virus capsid protein that right. is uh, perhaps doing the same thing as PLA2G16. Very cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. They make this cool statement here, which I think is very interesting. Viral restriction. So membrane damage 
they think membrane damage is triggering, you know, L, uh, L, what is it? L Gala S8. Viral restriction poses an intriguing impossibility. Effective restriction mechanisms cannot exist. Otherwise, the virus would not exist. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yes. Now, you might wonder, plot 2G, why does it exist to help the virus? Well, it doesn't. It's just no. The virus has evolved in, in ways. Selection has uh, allowed this to be beneficial to the virus. Um, so all these other viruses that they test here, uh, adeno, herpes, flu, VSV, do they, they all must get in through an endosome pathway. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And yet PLA2G doesn't affect any of them. So they're... Well, they have a different flu, solution have, to this problem. In, in yeah. flu, flu, we understand something of that solution. I don't know about the others. How about adenovirus, um, Kathy? Does, well, do we know how the, that? Yeah, it encodes the protein that ch- uh, changes the membrane curvature of the endosome, and then that allows the virus to escape the endosome. That was worked by um, Chris Wietoff in part okay. while he was in Glenn Nemero's lab, but then again on his own. So, so maybe they don't need PLA2G. Right. Right. Yeah, right. Apparently not, because uh, the the PLA two G negative cells are still susceptible to adenovirus. Yeah, that's right. of that, bro, that's very interesting. So that, there's uh, many many ways to skin this cat. You bet. But this is uh, an interesting result. I think really provocative, and I'm sorry that the paper is hard to read, but you got it here on Twiv. We explain it. That's right. Yeah, my my problem is that I you know I'm kind of at, at the my advanced years. I'm running out of patience with this okay. <laughs> <laughs> i see a, I see one of these things where every sentence is a thesis right and i go oh my god how am i going to make it through this but you know you stick with it and it starts to come together stick with it yeah okay. and you yeah. know i have twiv pressure i have to read yeah. it. that's right oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> i yeah. think that's a good thing they, they could have made some things a little easier even in their figures they have some model figures and stuff and they, they just they don't label things or they have they have a picture of a cell with a dotted white line. Is that the plasma membrane? Is that the endosomal membrane? Right. Uh, you know, just oh, if I Actually, could this, edit everybody's paper, it would be so good. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is one where a graphical abstract would help because this uh, figure four H where they have the model for what's going on. Yeah. If I yeah. uh, I should have looked ahead. I usually do yeah. skim through and look at the figures, yeah, that's but helpful, I didn't, isn't I didn't it? look yeah. carefully enough. Okay, because if I'd have found this and studied it ahead of time, it would have made it a little easier. Yeah, but there again, they don't they don't tell you what the different things are that aren't labeled, like the little red squiggle. Okay, it must be the RNA, but they yeah. could have told yeah. us that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, the legend the legend is this says it's a schematic model. Yep. Yeah. And they don't discuss it in the text really. Right. So, well, I yeah. mean, uh. you know, the the journal could have said, you know, this isn't clear. Could you fix this? They didn't want to. They didn't bother mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. and it's possible that the earlier version was clearer and the journal said shrink it. Yeah. 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 And they just ran out of font sizes below whatever that is that they've <laughs> used. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's do a few emails. David writes, Dear Twiv on Yellows. That's a new one. That's a good one. First of all, a happy new year to y'all. Just listened to the year overview and heard that number 23 was not in yet. So I mail in with this one. Uh, that was another book. Mm-hmm. After the reference to Ladri di Bicicletta, the bicycle thief, my head started filling with memories of glorious movies of bygone era. I would particularly recommend Riso Amaro, mm. 1949. Mm. Then I drifted off to the number 23, where Jim Carrey <laughs> becomes obsessed with numerical associations. Mm-hmm. I wonder now whether the number could have been a metaphysical reference to the number of chromosomes as a symbol of humanity, although I probably overthink it. Knowing Jim Carrey, I think you are. Because remember, <laughs> he thinks that vaccines cause autism. Yeah. <sighs> Just one more thing. I am hardly a mathematician, but the discussion on orthogonality sent me thinking. Orthogonality refers to angles of 90 degrees in three-dimensional axis systems, or as Wiki puts it, Orthogonality is the relation of two lines at right angles to one another, perpendicularity, and the generalization of this relation into n dimensions, and to a variety of mathematical relations thought of as describing non-overlapping, uncorrelated, or independent objects of some kind. Mm -hmm. Orthogonal planes hence meet where they intersect, or in the biological sense, where when they are relevant to the object of the study. 
wish you all the best for the new year and look forward to the next 50 episodes. <laughs> where uh, did I say, uh, where, I, I forget where we first encountered this. Where did this art about start? four twibs ago. That was uh, an orthogonal, was an orthogonal th- expression system. Translation, I think. Or translational system, which um, used oh, 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 suppressors. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The suppressors, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Alan, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Ian writes, hello to the TWIV team. Following up on TWIV 337 and the subsequent discussions on transmissible cancers in the CLAM, the same authors have a second nature paper I don't recall being discussed on TWIV and searches reveal nothing. (laughs) Um, The paper is called Widespread Transmission of Independent Cancer Lineages Within Multiple Bivalve Species and gives the link. Quotes, uh, these findings show that transmission of cancer cells in the marine environment is common in multiple species, that it has originated many times, and that while most transmissible cancers were found spreading within the species of origin, cross-species transmission of cancer cells can occur. The cross-species transmission is indeed between closely related species, but showing multiple occurrences is fascinating. With the two devil tumors, canine and steamer, and the several others from this paper, it seems ever more likely that this is not uncommon in nature, especially in those animals with no MHC or similar mechanism to recognize self, or with deficient MHC due to population bottlenecks. More benign, tumor-derived cell lines infecting species may be very hard to find without sequencing the whole organism. Traumatic insemination amongst insects comes to mind as one obvious route of transmission, as well as the obvious dissemination through filter feeding. I wonder when the first beneficial transmissible tumor cell line will be found. Hmm. From a cold and dull Scotland where I don't want to think too much about the temperature or climate outside. (laughs) (laughs) A beneficial transmissible tumor. What is that? Why would it be beneficial? Well, there is interest certainly in finding out whether human tumors are transmissible. Could imagine that. Of course. Might be, right? It's a matter of getting samples and looking for relatedness other than the ones that we know are infectious like hpv or uh, well, viral viral uh derived tumors right but right the cells but getting from the cells person. actually being yeah. transmissible so this study is from our colleague steve goff's lab it is. and we did his original study showing a transmissible tumor of a clam and and this shows that it happens in different types of uh, bivalves did dixon that's the right word yes it's true yep. bivalves yep uh, dixon please yes jamie right Hi, Twivologists. <clears throat> you had asked in an earlier episode uh, what other podcasts we listeners listen to, and for a while I was determined not to stray from the Twixt family ever. Call me crazy, <laughs> but it felt like cheating. <laughs> but eventually I caught up and had nothing new to listen to, so I regrettably started searching for other science shows. It took some searching, but I came across a podcast called Science, sort of. And though not refined like yours, eventually I was hooked. They covered a wide range of topics that are science, topics that are sort of science, and topics that wish they were science. <laughs> Notably, Science 244, where they interview Marv Roach for her new book, Grunt, and episode four, uh, 245, all about the science of Game of Thrones, spoiler included. There's science in that? <clears throat> I don't watch it, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> this podcast led to other interesting podcasts, including... History of English, a chronological history of the English language. Generation Anthropocene, stories about planetary change and defense of plants, all about plants. And they are constantly mentioning new podcasts that sound interesting too. But there is only so much time in the day, and then after all, I'm caught up with the latest tweeves. I appreciate that he felt like he was cheating, don't you? You know, that's (laughs) That's very nice. That's right. (laughs) like You know, I have Mary Roach's book, Grunt. I never, I didn't read it. I get a lot of books from from Norton. They just send them to me, um, and I got it, but I didn't read it. That's a, another term for a ground soldier. Ground soldiers. Uh, do you That's see what they're grunt, called. Do you see grunt on my shelf over there? Um, yeah, but I wish you'd clean it off because it's all over the place. Uh, you know? I don't know what it's about. I forgot. Uh, it says says the curious science of humans at war. Ah. Yeah, well, grunts. Oh, are, there you go. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard several discussions with her on various radio programs or read book reviews or something. Yeah. Mm. Grunt, tackles the, grunt, grunt, grunt tackles the science behind some of the soldiers most challenging adversaries, panic, exhaustion, heat, noise, and introduces us to the scientists who seek to conquer them. Ooh. Okay. I'll probably give that one away one of these days. 
<laughs> but you like to read science the, about the scientists behind the science, I do. Vincent. I, do. I should yeah. read it, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I can read it and give it away. I, I take yeah. good care of books. They're like new when I'm done with them. How about that? Now, Kathy, can you take next one, please? Sure. Andrea writes, since I am one of the non-scientists, non-medical listeners of your podcasts, parentheses, I listen to TWIM and TWIP too. This book is probably more of my speed, although I am learning a lot from your podcasts. I've learned to be afraid of mangoes, TWIP. <laughs> There's some kind of micro in the soil up here in the state of Washington that can kill me, TWIM. But I'm not afraid of vaccines, TWIP. <laughs> As always, thanks for all your work, Andrea. Seattle, 40 degrees Fahrenheit and rain, as if it would be anything else. Uh, some kind of microbe in the soil. Yeah, that would be cryptococcus. No. Oh. Right, Dixon? Well, yeah. Mangoes. Mangoes. And if you want to know what it means, folks. You'd have to listen to the episode. Listen. listen. It, was, right. it was very interesting. <clears throat> and we, we, we reach Rich Condit. <laughs> Jim writes, hi, y'all. I'm crossing my fingers that I am lucky number 17. Like another listener, I stumbled on TWIV while looking for a good virology textbook last year and have been listening intermittently hmm, ever since. <laughs> I'm sad that I missed the contest for a free copy of Principles for Vi of Virology 4th Edition since I am taking virology this uh. semester and have to buy a copy. <laughs> I'm writing from Bangor, Maine, where it's currently sunny and minus 12C. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I remember we went through that spell of many degrees below celsius you sure did but it's i'm glad they teach virology in maine well that, of course that, they do that uh, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> contest is over they, have, well, they even have universities up there well let's Dude. put it this way i'm glad they use our textbook uh, yeah. it's mm -hmm. even better right, right let's do a few more here uh justin writes this is for rich and he sends an, a link to an article. That's you, Rich Condit. Detection of vaccine virus in urban domestic cats in Brazil. And he writes, personally, I had no idea cats, domestic, but more likely peri-domestic, could serve as a potential vector. Are the titers high enough for transmission through saliva? I know cats constantly groom themselves, so perhaps it could be possible to have some virus on their claws. And if they scratch or bite, maybe transmission can occur. Either way, this is news to me. Mm. Rich, you know anything about that? Uh, unfortunately, I haven't. Uh, I haven't looked at this uh, particular paper. This is a group that is uh, part of the whole effort to um, characterize uh, what we call feral vaccinia in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That presumably came from vaccine that yeah. got back into the wild, and uh, you know they look at all sorts of different things. And apparently, they found evidence of uh, vaccinia in cats. It doesn't surprise me. Um, and I'm thinking that actually in Europe, cats are a pretty good vector of cowpox. Mm -hmm. So whether they're actually being mm -hmm. uh, actively infected and passing it, yeah, they probably are. Or just, uh, or just more like um, fomites. No, I think they're actively infected and, and passing it around. Well, they're, they're a reservoir and not a vector, though, right? Um, I hmm. guess yeah. I guess I, I learned that the term vector applied only to arthropods, but I, maybe that's oh, just okay. a bit of... Okay, fine, fine. I was being loose with the term. That's okay. <laughs> um, we are at Alan now. Alan Dove. Uh, <laughs> Who else okay. Would, what other Alan would be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nell or Neil writes, Dear all, in TWIV 423, you shortly discussed a potential norovirus toxin and someone mentioned the minor capsid protein as a candidate. Even though I have also heard speculations about a norovirus encoded toxin, I was so far not successful in finding any literature to back this up. As far as I know, the minor capsid protein, of which only a few copies are found inside the virion, is thought to be involved in particle assembly and possibly virion stabilization. However, for the putative toxi toxic effect, non-structural proteins are being discussed. The weather in Rotterdam is very Dutch, which means wet and gray. Best regards from Neil, who's at Erasmus Medical Center. Hence the term Rotterdam. I think no. Rich Pondit <laughs> mentioned the minor capsid. Yes, I did. I did. And that's because I have mm. uh, inside either a faulty memory or inside information. I think, oh. it's, uh, I think it's the latter. I don't, uh, yeah. it's, it's quite possible that none of this is published. Okay? <laughs> um, but I, uh, my recollection is that it's at least uh, 
tossed around amongst neurovirologists with a little bit of um, mm. experimental evidence to back it up that one of the capsid proteins or minor proteins may be uh, uh, an endotoxin. But uh, okay. it, no, it, it's quite possible that none of that is published. Dixon. Sam writes, dear Twiv team, I hope that I'm the 17th correspondent so I may win the book. The podcasts I listen to regularly include Audio Immunity, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me from NPR in Prenz. Yes, it's a radio show, but I listen to it exclusively as a podcast. And The Weekly Planet, a humorous Australian take on comic book and movie news. Since I wrote you last, I have succeeded in getting my parents, neither of whom have a background in science, into TWIV. Thank you for your wonderful podcast, Sam. The weather is 4C and rainy in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. So around the country, these emails were mailed at about the same time when that weather front came through and everybody got uh-huh. wet. Hmm. That interesting. I'm glad that Sam got his parents into it. That's cool. Absolutely. Yes. Really cool. Nice. Kathy. Jessica writes, hello, Twivers. My name's Jessica, and I'm a research tech at the University of Pennsylvania's Gene Therapy Program. I've been listening to Twiv for just about a year and very quickly discovered the rest of the Twix podcast. <laughs> I'm thoroughly addicted, and your conversations help pass the time on my commute every day. I would love to be the 17th email to receive the new book. I wish you all the best, and I would love to hear podcasts from you for many years to come. Thank you, Jessica. That's nice. Yes. yes. I also like how people discover one and then find the others. They're yes. all linked. That's They're why, linked. That's why I wanted to make one site with them all. It's a system. It's one a network. One website to contain them all. <laughs> to rule them all. <laughs> I tell you, it's a geodesic <laughs> dome of podcasts. All right, one more from And Rich. in the caps, it bind them. In the caps, it bind them, yes. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Rich Condit. Uh, are we at Chris? Chris. Chris writes, hello once again. It has been a weather roller coaster here in central Ohio over this past week. We had a high for the week of around 66F yesterday, but it had cooled to below freezing overnight, and it's currently around 30 as I write this email. I'm trying to hold off on sending this email after I was a whole uh, after I was a whole episode too early for being lucky email 23 in the previous contest. <laughs> the use of prime numbers as the lucky number makes me quite happy, although there does not seem to be a discernible mechanism as to why prime numbers are more pleasing than composite <laughs> numbers. It's uh, they're intrinsically more pleasing. Trust yes. me, I can <laughs> feel this. Um, perhaps. It is their indivisibility into smaller integers that makes them feel more wholesome, but that is pure speculation. This past week's weather may has made me curious whether you all have had the following long-term observations about the weather. Right. It seems like over the past five years, the extremes uh, temperatures of the year have become much more divergent than when I started to read the weather section in the newspaper about 15 years ago. Between when I started reading the weather section and when I left for college, I do not remember having any days in summer with a high of over 100 degrees or winter days below zero. And even single-digit winter days were pretty rare, though highs in the 90s were common during the summer months. However, over the past five years, it seems that there has consistently been at least one day with a high over 100 and another with a low below zero. Does this match your observations? When discussing this with my family, we seem to have the consensus that, at least in the Midwest, climate change is causing shorter and uh, colder winters. Hmm. Chris, P.S., what apps, newspapers, or websites do you all prefer to get your forecast from? I have far too many weather apps on my phone because I never ended up finding one that was clearly better uh, than all the others, since each one has a feature that I like and the others do not have. This made my day interesting yesterday when we were competing to give me, they were competing to give me notifications that the National Weather Service had a severe thunderstorm uh, warning. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, I don't know. Um, this is all anecdotal. Uh, this idea that there are uh, uh, greater extremes. It kind of feels right to me, but I don't, I don't know that we have any data to back I up. Think, I think we should avoid um, anecdote with regard to climate. Yeah, good point. <laughs> that, that, is, that is a rather notorious trap. Um, so I've just pasted in a link to NOAA's Climate Prediction Center, and I would just say you can go there and links therein. 
Um, you can look up archival data on climate and you can also, of course, find an entire literature that is studying this exact problem. Um, are we seeing greater extremes as a result of climate change? And there, I believe there is some evidence that we are and some evidence that this will continue to get worse. Um, but you can go to the primary literature and you can certainly go to the data, which for weather have been collected for a very, very long time. Right. Um, and uh, I, I think that would be the approach to take. I know, uh, Kathy and I both used to use a uh, an app. I don't know, what was it called, Kathy? Weather? It was called Weather, and I still have another one called Weather, but that one, that one that we both used stopped working. No, it was so good though, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I threw it away, and it was it was a two dollar app, I think, and I bought it because it was recommended. But now I use the the default iPhone Weather app, which is called Weather also, and it's based on the Weather Channel. Another yeah. one that that I like is AccuWeather. Yes, I, I like. I, that. Yeah, I think their weather is pretty good. You have to. You have to scroll through to find the kinds of things that you want, but you can get a lot of detail right. hourly for precipitation, real field, temperature, yep. and so on. There's so many weather apps in the app store. So Yeah. And I always, the thing I, I was citing at the top of the episode is the Aviation Weather Center. That's aviationweather.gov. Ah, right. uh, okay. And, I always uh, just... It's, sorry. That's, that is aimed <laughs> primarily at pilots, obviously, but if you look at the legend underneath it, um, and you decode the little symbols, you can actually get an interesting read on cloud cover. Um, so the, mm. the red dots and blue dots and purple dots indicate that there's lower and lower cloud cover. Uh, green dots indicate uh, clearer skies. Um, and then you can drill down into that and get uh, encoded weather reports. They're, they're pretty cryptic, but um, there, there are apps that will decode all that. When I'm on a desktop, I use the NOAA site. Right? Yes. Very good. I find that works pretty well. Yep. But I typically good. just use the Weather Channel, either on the desktop uh, or yeah. as an app. Yeah. And yeah. then I have specialized circumstances. I've got an app that's a hurricane tracker that just collates all the data <laughs> from a bunch oh, of different yes. sites to track hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for uh, boating, I've got a whole different set of things. The, one of the I always use uh, on a desktop the NOAA site for a marine forecast because it's actually very good. Right. And then I've got a, a, a an app called Boating Weather that just takes the uh, marine forecast from uh, NOAA, uh, and, I, and, and I use that. And there's one other that I really love. This is a sort of peripheral weather, but it's an app called Buoy Data. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. It collects, collects data from buoys. I, think I may have actually picked something like I think this you at did. one point. Um, and it's, uh, especially when there's a storm going through, it's fascinating. It's also good for scuba divers. You can find out the water temperature. Yeah. You know, I know there are people who don't like us talking about the weather, and now they're going to hate even more talking about weather apps. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. I have one other one I like. I think I paid for this one, too, Dark Sky. And it's the one that will tell you, <laughs> like, the nearest precipitation is 99 miles to the southeast right now. <laughs> like and if that. it's raining, it'll show you light, medium, and heavy. Wow. And, and the graph is constantly moving in real time. It's fun. I like that name. That's good. Mm -hmm. Of course, one of my favorites is not a weather app, but the one that Alan showed us that shows you the wind patterns. Yeah. Oh, this mm -hmm. is great. Yeah, 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 I think yeah, yeah. Kathy, Kathy picked that, too. Or was oh, it, yeah. It's been was picked and a, picked some other and a listener pick. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. It, it's really good. It's a recurring favorite. It's, it's I've mesmerizing. Got, I've got two that I look at routinely because I'm a trout fisherman. So, obviously, I'm interested in what the the waters are doing. And, and one of them is called Stream Watch. It's a USGS site that's part of the Drought Watch. And um, the Drought Monitor is also very telling in terms of knowing mm. – whose crops are going to fail where throughout the United States during the year. And, and um, there's been some remarkable droughts lately. Okay. And floods. Thank you, everyone. Time to move on to some picks of the week. Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, a news article that uh, you may have seen. Uh, it was Science <laughs> Magazine did, a, did an article on this. A I bunch did. of other people covered it and I tweeted about it and a bunch of other people did too. This is just really, really clever science. 
Um, one of the ongoing problems in poor countries in medical settings is they just don't have basic laboratory equipment. And one of the most fundamental things that you need in a medical lab is a centrifuge, right? Mm -hmm. Really simple device, spins things, but it costs enough that this is prohibitive in many parts of the world. And so um, some engineers who decided to try and address this problem took a very wide open approach. They said, what spins? What can we convert in some way in order to, you know, uh, how fast does a, does a salad spinner spin? How fast does an egg beater spin? And they, they tried all kinds of things. And they um, finally, they used um, super slow motion video, really high frame rate cameras to analyze the spin rate on a whirly gig which is this childhood toy that probably everybody has played with at some point. You take a, a loop of string and you put something on it with two holes in it and you twist the string and you move your hands out and back and it spins, right? Um, and it turns out that building one of these and spinning it, you can get up to 100,000 RPM. <laughs> wow. Um, it's an ultra centrifuge. Or actually not, a, yeah, but it's, it's you can get... Um, How many Gs yeah. is that? Mm. Um, it is, it's I'm not sure they do the calculation in the paper, but, um, it's easily enough that you can separate uh, plasma from blood oh, in sure. a couple of minutes. So they show this being done. They show taking a couple of capillary tubes and taping it to a piece of cardboard that they've put on a string with a couple of handles and they, they yo-yo it back and forth for a I'll couple bet. of minutes, I'll and they pull them that. off, okay. and you've separated plasma from blood, which is one of the most fundamental things you need to do in a medical lab. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, um, you know, you've got your red blood cells, you've got your, your serum at the top, and you can now do blood counts. You can do all this other stuff. Sure. Um, and the whole thing costs about 20 cents to produce, and you can show somebody how to use it in about 30 seconds. Um. So it's just a really, really clever approach to a widespread nice. problem. And I wanted to call that out. And there's a little video of it, too. Nice. That's neat. Uh, I've seen one which is just a string, right, and a tube holder at the yeah. end, and you just right. hold it above your head. And, you know. I'm going to tell my lab to start using this. <laughs> <I do. laughs> Can you imagine what the... Yeah. How, how many that RPMs? Works for really well for cesium gradients. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> It's a hundred thousand RPM, and they 000. also say they could isolate a malaria parasite within fifteen minutes yes. from blood using this. Yeah, so cool. hey, you could do it for twenty-four hours and do cesium rich. Because hey. I found a little, uh, I found a little chart here that allows me to convert uh, RPMs into relative centrifugal force. Right. Only it only goes up to twenty-five thousand. And let me see, this would be you know we're talking. I got a radius of rotation in millimeters, so call it seventy millimeters. It's going to be over thirty thousand Gs. Wow. Yeah. It's going to be it's going to be up to like fifty or a hundred thousand Gs. Amazing! You're starting a new really craze here. You're going to call it labrobics. It's amazing, Rich. What do you have for us? Uh, I, this I have posted several times and aborted at the last minute because this is my pick for when I don't actually have a science pick. <laughs> All right, because. Uh, and I could call Eric Clapton a scientist in his own right, but really he's an artist. Uh, this is uh, from the, in 1992, I think it was. There was a concert that was the 30th anniversary, yeah, 1992, 30th anniversary of Bob Dylan's performing career, where they where they got a whole bunch of artists together uh, to do Bob Dylan songs. And this is Eric Clapton doing "Don't Think Twice, It's All Right," which. You know, I knew from Bob Dylan, I knew from Peter, Paul, and Mary, <laughs> and it was always a good song and stuff like that. I never realized that until I heard Eric Clapton do it, that it is hard-ass blues. Okay? Oh, and yeah. this is just a great listen. This oh, is yeah. uh, Eric Clapton at his absolute best, doing <laughs> stuff with Bob Dylan that I never would have imagined. So, that's off the science arc, but there you go. Cool. Dixon, yes. Pommier. Um, I too have been saving this one for not so long. Uh, I ran across it, I guess, in one of my, um, uh, surfings through Yahoo news. And, um, it's actually a, a bunch of very beautiful, uh, underwater photographs of life that lives right next to the continental Antarctica continent. And they're 
surprisingly colorful. And it's just amazing to realize how life adapts to such ridiculously cold situations and produces such art. I would call this nature art. Uh, to look at these beautiful shapes and sizes and colors is just uh, fanciful, and yet it's real. That brings up an interesting question. Does it have to be conscious to be art? <laughs> of course not. Mm. Really? No. No, I don't. I don't. I think if you see art in it, and it's art, then it's art. Right? You could take a picture of things. No, like Picasso yeah. used a lot of real things and called them ready mades. And uh, okay, yeah, it's found art. Found. That's what I meant to say. Thank you. So, what is the? Uh, how cold does seawater get? It's minus. Because it's a super saturated yes. uh, uh, saline solution, so it's actually below zero, but not far below. Not far, but fish then, they don't have any red there's, cells. There's some lower limit. Yeah, there are fish don't. Fish would, don't have down there. Don't have red cells. They don't have any red cells. They just have clear fluid that flows through their veins and uh, arteries because um, it's so cold and the water is so super saturated that. Uh, with with oxygen because it's seawater typically seawater typically freezes at minus two Celsius. Right, right I googled it too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting for an entry, but I Alan think got there the first. The salinity of the ocean at that point is even higher than that, though, hmm. because uh, uh, there are some process that it undergoes. I think um, maybe some of the freezing process takes the water out, but leaves the uh, saline behind. But at any rate, these, and, these animals are adapted to really bizarre conditions. So Europa might fit into something like this, right? And for somebody who wants to think about it in Fahrenheit with respect to salt on their sidewalks or something, it's 28.4 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. That's where water <laughs> would freeze. Right. With salt. Right. But a saturated salt ice solution would be zero Fahrenheit. That's it. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked something, two videos, about Prince Rupert's drops. These are something cool. something I never knew about before. That's but if brilliant. you take molten glass <laughs> and you drop it into cold water, it uh -huh. will uh, solidify into a tadpole-shaped droplet. But in the very thickest part of it, it cools slower over time. And this gives properties to this Prince Rupert drop, which are just amazing. Prince in fact, the, the fat part of it, of the tadpole, if you will, is resistant to bullets and hammers and all kinds of things. But if you just tickle the tail of it, then the whole thing explodes. Really? And these two videos show that to you with uh, high-speed uh, camera work and this <laughs> really charming guy, uh, his web site or show or whatever is called Smarter Every Day. And the best part, I think, is in the first video about three minutes and 45 seconds in where he explains this phenomenon with him wearing different colored t-shirts and it's yes. just amazing. <laughs> so, I highly recommend you watch both one and two. Just yeah, I actually did that and subscribed to his site because it's so good. Yes. Those are bizarre Christmas ornaments. <laughs> <laughs> what amazes me is the he shoots he shoots uh, a twenty two he shoots bullets at these things, and the bullets hit the these bullets things shatter. and shatter. The bullets yeah. shatter. The yes. bullets shatter. Lord, and mm -hmm. the thing stays intact and stays intact. These, these are super hard. Then. Yeah, they're like tempered. Yeah, like, they, but they, what the happens fat is end that of it, it. Yeah, it sends a shock wave up through it that winds up in the uh, long run tweaking the little tail, which then causes the thing to explode. Got it. I, I, I can't believe these high-speed cameras. Like, we're talking 150,000 right. frames per second. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This fellow has 4 million YouTube subscribers. Because <laughs> <laughs> he does stuff yeah. like this. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, He is very cool. entertaining. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's charming. He should have his own TV set. show. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got a channel on YouTube with he 4 million. He has his own TV show, effectively. He's he got, yeah. He uh, doesn't have to worry about real TV, Dixon. He doesn't get paid. He does get paid. Sure he does. Oh, so? Yeah, he has ads on his program. Oh, he, he has yeah. ads and a Patreon. I got it. You know, people on YouTube okay. can make a lot of money. Okay. So, Dixon, you need to revise what you think is success. You know, I, <laughs> I have two picks. There are two articles that I think are very important. The first 
is an article from Wired uh, called Rogue Scientists Race to Save Climate Data from Trump. It's from Wired Magazine. I just said that. <clears throat> so there is uh, some speculation that the Trump administration will delete climate change data from the EPA website. In fact, they've already said they're going to get rid of some things like references to Obama's climate action plan and things like that that they don't like. But these individuals are worried that they're going to delete data, so they've been sitting around uh, downloading them, writing scripts to download <laughs> all the data so that it doesn't get deleted. And the idea that uh, this the data would be deleted, to me, is is obscene. Because as a scientist, that is what we work with. And if you don't agree with the data, you don't delete it. All right? You leave it there. And this is disgusting. So check that out. Um, and, uh, and, well, it's, not, it's equally bad. All right? <laughs> I'm sorry for two downer articles, but the world is uh, is not a happy place right now. This is a article by Stefano Bertuzzi, who's the CEO of ASM. It's called The Public Good and the Public Funding of Science. And he wrote this post in response to a Wall Street Journal article earlier this year, written by Tom Stossel, uh, a professor emeritus at Harvard Medical School, who title of the article is, Don't Thank Big Government for Biomedical Breakthroughs. The idea was that it's not academics that make the breakthroughs, but it's industry. Mm-hmm. And and Stefano is writing to argue that that's completely untrue. And if you go to industry, they will tell you that they don't do the breakthroughs and the innovation. It happens in academic laboratories. Now, I don't know why this individual is uh, writing no. this, but uh, Stefano wrote a blog post to uh, counter it, and I think it needs to get some circulation. Yeah, yes. This individual wrote that Wall Street that... Journal um, uh, article, first of all, because it's the Wall Street Journal, and that's what they do, and secondly, because he's <laughs> employed by the American Enterprise Institute, and that's what they do. Yeah. Isn't that disgusting, though? Yeah, but I, 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 I remember Bell Labs coming up with some wonderful things. That's not, uh, that's, a, that's a commercial. Yeah, commercial. And, and where's Bell Labs now? All uh, right, Agilent. Uh, this is, I, I, <laughs> but there, this is not what. Uh, and the only reason you could have Bell Labs at that time was because the phone company was a vast monopoly oh, of course, of course, that of abused course. its monopoly oh, power right. to make obscene amounts of profit that right, they right. needed to Quite to right. hole up somewhere. Yeah, you know. So they sank it into a research division. And and sure. yes, Bell Labs was an amazing, amazing Truly. place. It was like a government research facility. Yeah, exactly. And it had that level of support because yeah. it was built by a company that was parasitizing the public enough that they could uh-huh. funnel the money into that. Sure. That is not a sustainable model for science. Oh, no. So he says, Stossel argues that it is industry and not the federal government through the NIH, which fosters discoveries, breakthroughs, and innovation in bioscience. Nonsense. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. Anyway, no. he should read it. Um, now I'll try and find something more lighthearted next time. But Would you, yeah. please? <laughs> you know the other picks uh, offset my um, yeah. sternness. I guess you could say oh, yes. we have a listener pick from Sue Ellen. Maybe this has been picked before, but a friend who's a nurse practitioner sent me the link, and it was so good. I thought I'd pass it on. It's for all the ex- anti-vaccine people out there. There's here's a little science for you. <laughs> it's, it's an image gallery. Vaccines work. Here are the facts. Done in comic strip form. Is very good. Uh, you should check it out if you have someone that doesn't like vaccines. Send it to Trump. Yeah, why don't you send yeah, it to Trump? Yeah. Probably won't change the mind of any anti-vaxxers out there, but it does explain a lot of the scary things about vaccines in an easy to understand way. Best to you all, my TWIV family. Sue Ellen from Roswell, Georgia, where it was 65 degrees and cloudy today. Right now it's 58 and dark. Dark. We're the TWIV family. Isn't that nice? Cool. Two things today, cheating and the Twiv family. <laughs> yes. There you go. That's um, Twiv425. So we are still waiting to give away a copy of Infections of Leisure. <laughs> you know, we're waiting for the 17th emailer, which is a um, it's a prime number, right? It is. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and we're not uh, counting the people who were trying to be the 23rd. No, that's done. That was a copy from of the previous contest. So of virology. Yeah, I know. I read their emails just because there's cool stuff in them, but... Uh, Twiv at microbe.tv. And it could be very, very much that by the time you hear this episode, it'll be done. Uh, but, um, well, next week, if it's done, we'll, we'll give away another book. Yeah, right? Exactly. I got a pile of them. You've got a load. How do you get Twiv? <laughs> well, in the old days, you used to go to iTunes or you could go to microbe.tv slash Twiv and subscribe. But nowadays, everyone really listens to podcasts on their phone or, or tablet, in which case you have an app 
that will you can type in Twiv and it'll find it, and you can subscribe. So on iPhones, you know, the, the Apple sends you an app called Podcast, but I don't use that. I use another one. Uh, but um, you know, either way, it's free. Just subscribe and listen. Tell your friends about it. Send your questions and comments to Twiv at microbe.tv. And consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a Patreon account. We have other ways of helping us out. I notice a bunch of people have been buying Cafe Press stuff lately. All of a sudden, boom, T-shirts, mugs, etc. That's great. Um, why do we want your support? This year, we're going to travel. <laughs> we're going to ASV. We're all going to be at ASV. Yep. Um, Dixon is going to come out to Montana. In July, and who could resist that? Uh, and you know, <laughs> as I ch- as I get to places to go to, I will offer the Twiv crew the the opportunity to travel. And um, as Alan said, who would turn down paid expense travel? So we need your help to do that because you know when when Twiv goes to uh, Hamilton, Montana, they like to see these more than just me. It's true. They often say, "Where's the rest of your crew?" <laughs> so now we can do it if you help us out. Plus, we have other expenses as we grow. Uh, we have other expenses. We appreciate your, your support. And Vincent's constantly upgrading our equipment. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, we've, nice. had, we've had a round of upgrades. and We have. And uh, now Rich will be the last here. I'm trying to do it on other shows as well. So, Dixon de Pommier can be found at thelivingriver.org and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. You, you said no, not not. I did. <laughs> I did. Yes, sir. yes, yes. yes. That's Ka- me. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida Gainesville, currently broadcasting from Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. He's also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the sponsor of TWIV, Blue Apron. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>